Well, and uh, welcome to our nightly presentation. As always, this is Sammy Wilberforce with uh, uh, Gospel Sound as Rekindling uh, Reformation Ministry. And uh, I'm glad that um, we can be able to share in the word of God together and see what the Lord is speaking to us. Today, I'm going to touch on something on the uh, the lessons of uh, from the experiences of the children of Israel and uh, how they apply to us. And so I'm just praying that uh, we will be blessed together and uh, whatever the Lord will want us to learn in this session, may his grace be sufficient to open our eyes and to open our ears uh, that we may not ignore that which happened in the past and uh, what is going to happen in the near future. And so let us humble ourselves in the uh, word of prayer before we proceed. Dear yeah, Father in heaven, thank you once again. We pray that uh, you may minister unto us directly out of your spirit. And Lord, that uh, you may impress uh, deep things of your word um, in our hearts. The Lord, we may know your will upon us and uh, we may walk in that will. And so thank you because you will want us to learn that we may not repeat the past history in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, as I said that uh, we are going to learn from uh, the lessons, uh, lesson experience uh, and uh, what uh, the children of Israel were able to go through in their, in their lives and how that applies to us, because we are told that uh, there is nothing new under the sun, and also that um, the past uh, history God required of it. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the Lord will want to help us have information, a saving information, so that uh, we may not repeat the history in uh, a negative way. And so. I hope that uh, we will learn from the things that uh, we are going to be able to share in today. In the book of First Corinthians, in the book of First Corinthians, chapter 10, First Corinthians chapter 10, And uh, verses 11, we are told, now all these things happen unto them for ensembles, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so we, we can be sure that uh, the things that happened with the children of Israel, uh, they were for our learning in uh, the times that we are living in. And so Mostly, I, I'm going to look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, and uh, see what the Lord will want us to learn. I'd like to look at the book of Daniel, chapter uh, Ezekiel, chapter 8, and see what the Lord will want us to learn from it. Uh, we are told that the modern church is repeating the history of the ancient Israel, and uh, from Healthful Living, page 280, paragraph 1, the trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ illustrates the position of the people of God in the experience before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so uh, if we ignore what um, really these people pass through, then uh, we are going to be a victim of history. The story of uh, the Israelites, their captivity, and their rejection as uh, the repository of the Holy Oracles has been all allegory to nations and a case study to Bible um, uh, prophecy students. And uh, since the rejection of the Jewish nation in AD 34, and uh, it is destruction uh, of their temple in AD 70, those who have believed in Christ as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world have been drafted in the Israel of God. And so uh, what happened to Israel can happen to any nation, can happen to any church. 
there is no church or there is no nation that is called by God in impunity. In uh, every advance of step, there are requirements, there are things God expects of us, and if we do not fulfill them in our lives, then uh, we can be cut off as even Israel was cut off. In Galatians 6.16, 6, we find that as and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God, those only who will accept to do that which is the will of God, then they are the Israel of God. And also when you check out in the book of Romans chapter two, verses um, uh, 25 to 29, we are told for circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law. But uh, if there will be a break of the law, the circumcision is made an uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is uh, one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward or in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. And uh, sometimes we call ourselves uh, a remnant church and a remnant people, but uh, nothing, nothing can be so um, deceptive as... Uh, just going by name instead of going by character. People think that at uh, the moment you are called a remnant church or a remnant people, then uh, you can do whatever thing that you can do and still God will acknowledge you as his people. No, Israel, who are the sons of Jacob, were once the children of God. But when they polluted the sanctuary of the Lord and when they uh, killed the prophets whom Christ had sent. And uh, they did very bad things. Uh, Christ rejected them and took the Gentiles to be repositories of the truth. In fact, they went into Babylonian captivity. Some went down in Migdol in Egypt. And so we, we take one of the instances of the captivity of the children of Israel, their behavior and their final end in view of the end time events and application to the Israel of God. That um, uh, as we have read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11, that uh, now all these things happen unto them for ensembles, and they are written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, that um, they are calling their rejection uh, is um, a sample to us. It's a lesson to us. It's an experience that uh, we have to share in. And uh, in, uh, in, in the journey right there from Egypt and going to Canaan and then uh, being able to dwell in that land, God working for them, and then their apostasy, and their ecumenical uh, 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 um, uh, approaches and all that stuff. They, these are lessons, these are experiences that we have to learn as uh, the Israel of today or the children of God who have been called to be in this world as a distinct people bearing the light to the four corners of um, the world. And so right there in uh, in. Uh, 1888 messages in uh, 1888 messages page uh, 533 paragraph one. Um, I'd like us to reiterate what we are talking about and uh, see what is, is it that uh, we want to learn. We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just um, before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate 
the position of the people of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ, how the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jewish. And today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. 1888 messages, page 533, paragraph one. But um, then when I was doing a study of um, what happened to the children of, of Israel and what is happening to us today, there's something so amazing in PP um, that uh, I find that it is, it is happening even amongst us today. And uh, I, I like to read, it is, um, I'd like to give you a reference. It is in PP. It is in PP 689, 688 to 689. PP 688 to 689. Now, I want you to think about this, what happened to the Israel of the old and uh, try to figure out what is happening to the Israel of today. And uh, if you have uh, your laptop or your computer or your phone, you can check. It is PP 688.3 to PP 689.1. It says, Satan was determined to keep his hold on the land of Canaan, and when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel, and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted their destruction. Now, li li listen to this, uh, how he plotted for the destruction of Israel in Canaan, and how he is plotting for our destruction before we enter into the land of Canaan, the spiritual Canaan. Through the agency of evil spirits, strange gods were introduced. Is that familiar with you? Strange gods were introduced. And because of transgression, the chosen people were finally scattered from the land of promise. This history Satan is striving to repeat in our day. The introduction of what? Of strange gods. God is leading his people out from the abominations of the world that they may keep his law. And because of this, the rage of the accuser of our brethren knows no bounds. The devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. That is Revelation 12, verse 10 and 12. It continues to say, the antitypical land of promise is just before us and Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. The admonition, watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation was never more needed than now. And uh, how did he, how was he able to keep them out of uh, the promised land by introducing strange gods? And uh, you can bear witness that uh, if we are told that history will repeat itself and their experience has to teach us something, then we must so, be so vigilant so that strange gods may not be introduced amongst us to keep us from the land of Canaan. And so this brings us to the book of Ezekiel chapter 8 and uh, I want us to look at Ezekiel chapter 8 and what is happening in Ezekiel chapter 8, and then uh, we can uh, share in these lessons and the experiences in our time that we are living in. The 8th chapter begins a new stage of uh, Ezekiel's prophecies and continues to the end of uh, the 11th chapter, and you find that uh, in chapter 8 we have the apostasy, in chapter 9 we have the sealing, and in chapter 11 we have... Uh, in chapter 9, we have the ceiling. Chapter 10, we have uh, the angel moving into the threshold and then leaving the courtyard. And then chapter 11, actually, this is deserting completely of uh, that uh, area. And so this prophecy carries us from Dan Ezekiel chapter 8 to uh, Ezekiel chapter 11. The connected visions at Ezekiel chapter 3 are... Uh, verse 12 to 7 to Ezekiel chapter 27 comprehend Judah and Israel. But the visions of Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 1 to 11 refer immediately to Jerusalem and the remnant of Judah under Zedekiah as distinguished from uh, the Babylonian exiles. 
So being brought then to the gate of the door of the house, Ezekiel saw women weeping for the Tammuz or what we call Adonai. And uh, as Ezekiel returned to the court of the priest between the porch and the altar, he saw 20, 20 and five men with their backs to the sanctuary and their faces towards the east, worshiping the rising sun. This is the substance of the vision contained in the eighth chapter. And you cannot miss that time. Uh, when the sanctuary was built, the door was facing to the east so that when you went, actually you were worshiping uh, uh, God while uh, your back were on the rising of, uh, 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 of the sun. But uh, when now you face the sun, it was like a sun worship. And so we, as we read through Ezekiel chapter 8, you, you, you find that uh, it can be deduced that the Lord did abandon his people, his city and his temple and the abominations of the people in public and in private. Uh, and why did that happen? You, you can go back to the book of Jeremiah chapter seven, where the people were crying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, while they were carrying out all these abominations. And then he told them, will you profane my house murder, kill, oppress, and then you go ahead and say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord he is. No, it cannot. He told them, go to Shiloh and see what I did at Shiloh. And uh, when you go back to the history of, the Sh of Shiloh, you find that um, in Shiloh, actually, uh, when the sons of Eli were doing all this abomination and the children of Israel, the Philistine took over the ark and uh, um, the glory of the Lord departed from that place completely. It uh, departed from that place. And so um, the, the people, uh, there, there are those who were carried into captivity with Jeconiah, and uh, they later acknowledged their sins. And uh, God was able to tell them that he shall bring them back to a happy state uh, in temporal and spiritual matters, while the others who had filled up the measure of their iniquities should be speedily brought into the state. So Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we read that, uh, and it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day, of um, the man as I sat in mine house and the elders of Judah sat before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld and lo a likeness as the appearance of fire from a, um, appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire and from his loins even upward as the appearance of uh, brightness as the color of uh, amber. Verse three, and he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now, in the sixth year, we are talking namely of the captivity of Joachim, as it's indicated in the book of Ezekiel chapter one, verses two. And so the, the fifth year is uh, here is specified the lying on his side 390 and 40 days in Ezekiel 4 verses 5 and 6 had by this time been completed, at least in vision. And uh, that event was natural a memorable epoch to the exiles and the computation of years from it was to humble the Jewish as well as to show their perversity in not having um, repented, though so long and severely chastised. During the captivity of Jehoachim, Mataniah, who was named Zedekiah, was uh, the made the king as uh, you look in the book of Second Kings, chapter twenty-four, verses thirteen to seventeen. Then Zedekiah was the son of Josiah, the brother to Joachim, the father of Joachim. In uh, you can check uh, the history in the book of uh, First Chronicles, chapter three. You will find all the history of um, the nation of Israel and their kings and uh, the family tree. And so. Ezekiel comes there and uh, he is shown the image of jealousy, but we ask, what is this image of jealousy? Uh, some, some say that it was the image of Baal, which was placed in the temple of Manasseh. 
but others that uh, it may be the image of Mars, uh, of Mars and others uh, it may be the image of Tammuz or Adonai. And uh, there are others who are conjecturing, conjecturing about uh, Venus, which is the uh, Jupiter or Venus, the queen of uh, heaven. And so uh, whichever of these uh, that we may choose of, uh, we find that uh, it is something that did not please God. And in verse four, he says, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that uh, I saw in the plain. That is the Shekinah glory, uh, the cloud of Jehovah's glory. Notwithstanding all this provocation that was going on in the book of Ezekiel chapter eight, and all this idolatry, the Shekinah glory still remained in the temple uh, like that which he saw in Ezekiel chapter three. Uh, and uh, this continued to happen until you reach in the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, where the glory is now lifted up and lifted off and it goes to the threshold. It left, it did leave Jerusalem showing the long suffering of God, which ought to move the Jewish to repentance. But uh, actually as repentance is a gift, these people did not receive the gift of repentance. And, uh, you know, the Lord reckons with the nations. And when their limit reaches, then he leaves them because uh, our God is not a God who forces things. He doesn't do things arbitrarily, but um, he is a God who really respects freedom of conscience and liberty of conscience so that uh, people um, may do what they want. But uh, as the Lord continues persevering with everyone that they may come to the fold, we are told that the Lord is not slack. In 2 Peter 3, 9, we are told that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but it's long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you can read that in Ezekiel chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 34. And um, he says that he did not delight in the death of the wicked rather that they may repent and uh, have eternal life. And he says that uh, wherever it takes, I'll send them shepherds so that they may choose between the sheep and the goats. And then he will put his spirit in man that uh, man may be washed. He may be sprinkled with water that he may be washed from his idols. And that is what he promised Israel. And that is what he is promising unto us. And so when you move to Ezekiel 8.5, uh, we read that, then said he unto me, son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north and behold northward at the gate of altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So try to imagine this in the way of the northward. And um, this is um, the principal avenue to the altar of the burnt offering as to the northern position, when you read that in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 14, Ahaz had removed the brazen altar from the front of the Lord's house to the north of the altar, which he had himself erected. The locality of the idol before God's altar also enhances the heinousness of the sin, which means that the worship of God is removed and the worship of, um, I can say heathens in paganism or the worship of man, or the idols of man is placed just when, where actually the worship of God should be continue, uh, should be happening. Now, this is not something new. Try to remember this. Um, there was a garden of uh, Eden planted in this east. There was a garden in the east. And then what happens? The serpent leads Eve to commit sin, and then Eve seduces the husband to commit sin. And what does Satan do? At the very place where God used to meet with man, there actually Satan puts his capital city. And uh, from there he has hanging gardens to mimic the original garden of Eden. And there he creates a city of rebel rebellion where there was a city of obedience or a garden of obedience, he says they're a garden of uh, rebellion. 
And so when we find that uh, the place of the worship of our sovereign God is replaced by men's idols, we may know that this is not man's doing, but it is Satan's doing. And this is the war he started back in the heaven, brought it in Eden, and he's continued in, on this earth. And uh, uh, the lamentation continues in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 6 and 10. Verses 6 to 10. He said, Furthermore, unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abomination that the house of Israel committed here that I should go for far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see great abominations. Verse 7, and he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall, and when I dig in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, go in, and behold, the wicked abomination that they do here. Now, it is interesting, verse 10, so I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall around about. Now, the sanctuary, the way it was built, it didn't have any window because it had only a door. And there's a reason for Christ says in John chapter 14, verse 6, um, the truth, the way and life, no one cometh to the Father but through me. And so to enter the sanctuary, you had to enter through the door which represented Jesus Christ. Now, finding a hole actually in the wall meant that these people bypassed the door, which is Jesus Christ, and wanted to enter into the sanctuary or in heaven by their own means. And many of us are doing the same thing. We will not come to Christ that we may have his spirit. We will not come to Christ that we may have life. There are some things we are devising in our life that uh, will uh, really uh, uh, strike like uh, our means to heaven and not through Jesus Christ. And so these are new age beliefs. These are satanic beliefs that man by his own devising can get up to heaven and not through Christ. And so that is something that um, should really uh worry us that man can devise a way into heaven. And uh, in uh, John chapter 10, Christ says that uh, um, the door to the ship, anyone who enters through the window is not, uh, is not a shepherd, but he is a hireling. He cometh in to destroy them. And so we can be sure if we are devising any other way to go into the sanctuary, then it's not the way of the Lord, but it's our way. And uh, the end therein shall be the end of Israel. And so it is very likely that these images portrayed on the wall were the objects of Egyptian adoration. But I want you to notice that uh, we have um, what? We have um, creeping things and uh, abominable beasts. Don't forget that. And uh, you can uh, check your Bible, Revelation chapter 18, what it contains. Revelation chapter 18, and uh, verse uh, 2. This, the angel is crying in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. This is like unto the things that you are seeing in the book of uh, Ezekiel. This is a confederacy of apostasy bringing into the sanctuary things which uh, cannot be allowed to be there. And so it is very likely that these images portrayed on the wall were the objects of the Egyptian adoration. The ox, the ape, the dog, the crocodile, the ibis, the scar bears, or beetle, or various other things. It appears that these were privately worshipped by the Sanhedrin or Great Jewish Council, consisting of 70 or 72 persons, six chosen out of every tribe as representative of the people. The images were portrayed upon the wall, and so we find those ancient idols at the walls of the tombs of the kings and nobles of Egypt. And um, 
when, when you read uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4, the Lord tells us, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. But you find that this Sanhedrin, we are not talking about the worldlings or the other churches. We are talking about the trials and the experience of the children of Israel and the lessons that we may drive today from it. And so all these things they had done and brought them into the sanctuary. And when we look at our worship today, in this day of atonement, can we say that uh, our sanctuary set up our praise, adoration, and worship is according to the will of God, or there are some other things that the Lord may see and say, this is a perversion of my worship. Just like in the worshiping of the golden calf, Israel at this point had bent their hearts to Egypt and nothing could dissuade them. Though it could be heard aloud from their lips, their actions speak louder. They, they, they are the ones that you could hear the sound that uh, uh, Mo this Moses, we do not know of him. What he's doing in the mountain, make us gods that we may go back to Egypt. These are the lessons that are being repeated there. In Ezekiel 8, 11, we read that, uh, and there stood before them, 70 men of the ancient of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his sender in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. Now, this is no more difference from uh, what you read in the apostasy in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 32. The people made a calf and they made uh, a proclamation this is the feast of the Lord, and uh, they rose up to play and did all manner of things. Now, I'd like to share something that um, I don't want to escape from my mind in this uh, story. Uh, we are told in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Who is this? Shaphan was a scribe of what some call controller of the temple in the days of Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 10 to 14. And uh, Jezaniah, his son, succeeded him in this office. He was at the head of this band of idolaters. In Ezekiel 8, 11, the very name means Jehovah hears, giving the lie to the unbelief, which virtually said, Ezekiel 9, 9, the Lord sees not. You can compare that with Psalms 10, 11, 14, and 50, 21, 94, 7, and 9. The 70 members composing the Sanhedrin, or the Great Council of the Nation, the origination of which we find in the 70 elders, representative of the congregation who went up with Moses to the mount to behold the glory of Jehovah and to witness the secret transactions relating to the establishment of the covenant. Also, in the 70 elders appointed to share the burden of the people with Moses, how awfully it aggravates the national sin that the 70 once admitted to the Lord's secret council in Psalms 25, 14, should now in the dark enter the secret of the wicked. Uh, as you read Genesis 49, 6, those judicially bound to suppress adultery being the ringleaders of it. The offering of incense belonged to the elders, but to the the offering of the incense belonged not to the elders, but to the priest. This usurpation added to the guilt of the former. They spared no expense for their idols or that they were the same liberality known toward the cause of God. And so on. this uh, change of God, this change of uh, priesthood and uh, delegation of duties with the children of Israel is uh, what we can say we are even experiencing today that uh, uh, there is a confusion in the church who should do what and who should do what and uh, so the, uh, the things of the Lord are profaned by everyone just doing the way they would like like the elders were uh, offering incense instead of the priest 
In Ezekiel 8, 12 to 14, we read, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his image? For they say, The Lord sees us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said uh, also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see great abomination that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Interesting. Now, who was Tammuz? Actually, we ask ourselves, who was Tammuz? And uh, a little history will uh, not uh, do us bad in knowing who this Tammuz is. Uh, Tammuz was uh, the third date in Babylon and formed the third part of the trinity of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. The Trinity doctrine of the purpose it comes from this. This is none other than the worship of uh, Catholic Trinitarians within the church. And uh, these are the things that you find that if you are following this uh, uh, orthodox uh, 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 doctrines of Trinity, then you are not different from uh, the people who are actually in Ezekiel chapter 8. The mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the church. Handbook for today's Catholic, page 16. Now, Adam Clark has this to say. This was Adonis or Adonis. He is fabled to have been a beautiful youth beloved by Venus and killed by a wild boar in uh, Mount Lebanon when springs the river Adon Adonis, which was fabled to run blood at his first at his festival in August. The women of Phoenicia, Assyria, and Judea worshiped him as dead with deep lamentation, wearing um, uh, pripe and uh, other obscene images all the while. And they prostituted themselves in honor of this idol. Having for some time mourned him as dead, they then supposed him revived and broke out into the most extravagant rejoicings of the appearance of the river at this season, Mr. Mundrell or Mondrell thus speaks. We had the good fortune to see what is the foundation of the opinion which Lucian relates this, that this stream at certain seasons of the year, especially about the feast of Adonis, is um, of a bloody color, proceeding from a kind of sympathy as the heathens imagine for the death of Adonis who was killed by a wild boar in the mountain out of which these stream issues. Something like um, this uh, we saw act come to pass for the water was stained to a surprising redness. And as we observed in traveling, had stained the sea a great way into a reddish hue. This was no doubt occasioned by a red ochre over which the river ran with violence at this time of uh, its increase. And so you can find that uh, these people were embracing the heathen deities inside the sanctuary of the Lord. Now, let this not escape our memory here. Uh, they were worshiping Tammuz, the son of Nimrod by Semiramis, the wife which she claimed she was impregnated by the rays of the sun, the supposed Nimrod after his disappearance. When Nimrod disappeared, Semiramis went to look for him and then he, she was impregnated by the race and then called the sun Tammuz. That is um, the legend say so. This was sun worship. In Jeremiah, they had been worshiping her mother, Semiramis. And um, uh, in Ezekiel now, Ezekiel is shown the worship of uh, Tammuz. But then you have to go a little bit earlier in the book of um, Jeremiah chapter 7. Um, they were worshiping Semiramis, the wife, as the moon and Tammuz, their son, as the son of the sun. And so this is what we find in Jeremiah chapter 7. Look at um, how this apostasy began and how it uh, proceeded. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 4 and 14 to 18, trust ye not in the lying world, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are this. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I'll cast you out of this of my sight, 
as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. You know, Ephraim was joined to idols, and uh, the Lord says, leave him alone. Therefore, pray not down for these people, neither lift up, cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto, the, unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anchor. And so, this is the worship that was going in in Israel. We are told here is a description of a whole family gathered together and acting unitedly in idolatrous worship. The children go and collect wood and bring it to the place of sacrifice. The fathers lay it in order and kindle a fire. The mother and her maids knit down, make their batch, and out of it form cakes and bake them for the honor of the queen of heaven. Most probably the moon, though perhaps not exclusive of the sun and planets, generally called the host of heaven. And so family worship is a most um, amiable and becoming thing when performed according to the truth. What a pity that so few families show such a zeal for the worship of God as those apostate Israel did for that of their idols. Not merely isolated individuals practiced idolatry. Young and old men and women and whole families contributed their joint efforts to promote it. All that there were the same, were the same zeal for the worship of God as there is for error. Now, cakes were made of honey, fine flour, in a round flat shape to resemble the disk of the moon to which they were offered. Others read, others read as margin the frame of heaven, that is the planets general. The male and female pair of deities symbolized the generative powers of the nature, hence arose the introduction of prostitution in the worship. The Babylonian, Babylonians worshipped Ashtoreth as Milita, uh, that is generative. Our Monday or Moon Day indicates the former prevalence of moon worship. You can read that in Isaiah 65, verse 11. This worship of the father, mother, and son is pure Roman paganism of Trinity comprising of Father, Mary, and Jesus. In Isaiah 65, verse 11, we read, but ye are, but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. This is at uh, Mount Moria on which the temple was. The Israelite worshipped God, the Babylonian god of fortune, the planet Jupiter, answering to Baal or Bel. The Arabs called it the greater good fortune, and the planet Venus, answering to many, the lesser good fortune. This is uh, the senior's kimchi. Uh, Tables were laid out for their idols with all kinds of viands and a cup of containing a mixture of wine and honey in Egypt, especially on the last day of the year. This is reported by um, uh, Jerome. And so you find that uh, this idolatry is uh, going on in the temple. And uh, the Lord has a lamentation. The Lord has a lamentation in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 33. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgment, as did David his father. And the Lord asked them, in uh, Jeremiah 7, 19, the Lord asked them, do they provoke me to anger? said the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? And this is what we are finding, that actually every day, as we go into idol worship, as we go into worship of self, we are not provoking the Lord to anger. Actually, what we are doing, we are confusing ourselves. And what is confusion? Confusion is Babylon. And uh, those who uh, actually participate in the worship of idols and the gods of uh, the pagans and the gods of the orthodox uh, 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 churches actually shall be confused or shall be part of uh, Babylon. Um, and so when uh, Jeremiah tried 
try to confront these people. It is amazing the answer you hear from them. And it is like uh, the answers we hear in the church. You know, we are doing this because our fathers did this. Or we are doing this because now we have come to a better understanding. And so what our fathers believe that does not matter to us, we have come to a better understanding. Or the people will say, who are you to judge us? And our fathers did this. And maybe our fathers did not understand what they were doing. The knowledge that our fathers had and their responsibilities are different from the knowledge we have and uh, our responsibilities. And uh, we have to make sure that what we are doing is not traditions and dogmas and doctrines of men, but what does say the Lord. So when Jeremiah confronted these people, what did they say at uh, the end? What did they tell him? In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 44, verses 16 to 18, we are told, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. So the, the, the people are telling Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was calling them unto restoration and repentance, the people say that the word you have spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out bring offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals or instruments and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So this was blood and blasphemy. They accused God of not providing for their basic temporal needs. And uh, do we think that that is what God really did? When he says in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. It is not the change in the Lord, but the change in the people which affected all these things. And so uh, the Lord himself has promised in the book of Matthew chapter 6 from verses 25 to 34 that um, we should not take thought of what we shall eat or what we shall drink nor for our body or what we shall put on. But uh, in verse 33, he says that um, uh, seeking the kingdom of God and uh, his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. But then you find that the Israelites, instead of seeking the Lord and going through the door, they went through the hole in the wall. And so they bypassed the blessings of the Lord and they sought it in another way. And what only followed after them is famine, it is uh, captivity. And we find that uh, their claim that it was lack of God's lack of providence that drove them to idol worship was turning a truth into a lie. The Lord had not forsaken them, but uh, they had forsaken the Lord. They had become a generation which professed godliness, but they didn't have the power there in as uh, it's recorded in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. In Ezekiel 8, 15, then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than this. As if what they had, uh, uh, Ezekiel had seen was not enough. Then the next are greater abominations, in which we are not in respect to the idolatry, but in respect to the place in which the persons committing were. Remember, the first sins and the first idolatry was happening at the altar of a burnt offering in the courtyard. But now he says that enter into the shrine, enter into the most holy place and thou shalt see greater things. So it is not the greater idolatry they are performing, but the place where it is situated that makes it a great abomination. Just like uh, there are things which are allowed in the courtyard in the life of a Christian, but they are not allowed in the most holy place. So while it will be permissive will of God for something to happen in the courtyard, it won't be his perfect will in the most holy place. And so if that is the way in which righteousness can be measured or uh, a way of life of a Christian can be measured, so also in 
the evil life. If uh, there is some certain evil happening in the courtyard, it can be called lesser evil. But when it is happening in the most holy place, you understand that is a greater evil. So in, in the inner court immediately before the door of the temple of Jehovah between the porch and the altar where the priest advanced only on extraordinary occasions, like uh, we found it in Joel 2.17, 25 men, the leaders of the 24 courses or orders of the priest, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 18 and 19, with the high priest, the princes of the sanctuary, representing the whole priesthood and their faces towards the east, making obeisance to the rising of the sun. Sun worship came from the Persians who made the sun the eye of their god, Omzid. It existed as early as in the book of Job, chapter, chapter 31, verses 26. And uh, you can compare that with Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 9. Josiah could only suspend it for the time of his reign in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Prophets and Kings, page 448, paragraph 2. I'd like us to read something in this uh, book, in Prophets and Kings, page 448, paragraph uh, 2. We are told, in the sixth year of the reign of the Dekar, the Lord revealed to Ezekiel in a vision some of the abominations that were being practiced in Jerusalem and within the gate of the Lord's house and even in the inner court, the chambers of images and the pictured idols, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel. All this in rapid succession passed before the astonished gaze of the prophet in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 10. Um, continued on, those who should have been spiritual leaders among the people the ancients of the house of Israel to the number of 70 were seen offering incense before the adulterous representations that had been introduced into hidden chambers within the sacred pressing gates of the temple court. The Lord seeth us not. The men of Judah flattered themselves as they engaged in their heathenism practices. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. They blasphemously declared in verses 11 and 12. There were still greater abominations for the prophet to behold. At the gate leading from the outer to the inner court, he was shown women weeping for Tammuz and within the inner court of the Lord's house, at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar, were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worshiped the sun toward the east, verses 13 to 16. And now the glorious being, who accompanied Ezekiel throughout his astonishing vision of wickedness in high places in the land of Judah inquired of the prophet, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I pity. And thou... They, and though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, you will ye, yet will I not hear them. In Ezekiel 8, 16, uh, as the story continues, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and though they put the branch to their nose. So uh, this, the children of Israel were told not to worship the heavenly bodies nor pay homage to it in whatever manner or shape. In Deuteronomy 4, 15, 19 to, to 19, we read, Take ye therefore a good heed unto yourself, for ye saw no manner of similitude of the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourself and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. 
the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that filleth the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eye unto heaven. And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven should be drawn to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. And so this is something that uh, the Israelites were warned against. Also, you can read that in Deuteronomy 17, verses 2 to 6. Um, in the building of the sanctuary, the door of the sanctuary was placed in the east so that when Israel entered the sanctuary, they could worship facing the west so as not to pay obeisance to the heavenly bodies. But um, uh, you, you find that in Ezekiel chapter 8, they have turned their back to the sanctuary and they're worshiping the sun to the east. And uh, when we abandon the pure religion and start worshiping at the fallen churches of sun, they do, then friends, we have turned into sun worship in the east. You find that uh, all these jokes on the pulpit, all this Babylonian music, all this ordination that we are crying about, all this spiritual formation, ecumenical, and the rejection of the spirit of prophecy is nothing but uh, turning our back onto the sanctuary. And so uh, this is the same thing that uh, happened in Daniel chapter 8, verses 10 to 12, where actually uh, we are told that um, the little horn crumbled upon the sanctuary and truth was cast to the ground. And then Daniel cried out, till when will these things continue? And then the Lord told him, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And we are in the times of uh, cleansing the sanctuary. We are in the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And uh, all these abominations which are done in the fallen churches should not be found in us. Remember, uh, we are talking the trials of the children of Israel prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ has been shown that it will be the same trials uh, to the church of God prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so all these abominations that we are seeing in Ezekiel chapter 8, it will repeat itself because it was written for our ensembles to whom the ends of the world has come according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12. And so if um, we are not keen, really, we are told in Great Controversy, page 608, paragraph 2, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join in the ranks of the opposition. And so by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. And so everything that we are introducing in our churches, everything that we are introducing in our camp meetings, can they stand the test of the time that they are according to the sanctuary truth? If we look everything that we are doing as a people, as a church right now, and they be put in the light of the sanctuary as the children of Israel were put in the light of the sanctuary, will we stand the test of the time or we, will we be found uh, winding in the balances of the sanctuary? In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 17, as we bring this to a close, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to uh, the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to the nose. And so this is more proverbial, as uh, Calvin says. Mm. They turn up um, the word, the nose in scorn, expressing their insolent security not content with their outraging, with their violent, the second table of the law, they go on to destroy the first table of the law. They hated each other. They had built the walls of partition. And if that was not enough to them, they wanted to do away with God himself. Now, where do you get the idea of hating your neighbor and then 
wanting to do away with God himself. You get it from Satan in Isaiah chapter 14. He didn't want Christ. And not only did he not want Christ who was uh, uh, next to him and who was his neighbor, but he was going after God himself because he says that I'll ascend above in the skies and I'll sit on the sides of the north in the mount of congregation and I'll be above the stars of God. Now, if you are above the stars of God, if you have done away with Christ, whom else are you competing with? You are competing with God and you want to be above God. And so all these abominations, they were not only to uh, obliterate the love for one another, because at this point when all these things are happening, uh, Israel had been split into two, the northern and the southern kingdom, and there was no love between the, the two. And also they hated other people whom they had to minister to, the Samaritan and the Gentiles. And everyone was seeking of his own way because we read that uh, and uh, Israel in those days, there was anarchy. Everyone did what uh, it seems best in their own eyes. And uh, that was the position of Israel. And also when you come to the church today, it seems that there is no control. It seems that there is no discipline. It seems that everyone wants to go their own way. The love for one another has waned. It has become so called. In fact, we are told in Matthew chapter 24, uh, is that verse 12, because um, the love of many shall grow cold, so uh, sin shall uh, increase or sin shall multiply. And, and so we see that um, the experiences of the children of Israel, there are lessons for us today. Ezekiel 8, 18, therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I pity, and though they cry in my ear, ears with a loud voice, yet I'll hear uh, them not. And uh, you find that uh, in Jeremiah chapter 11, God tells uh, Jeremiah that there is a conspiracy, not a conspiracy against the Lord, but also a conspiracy against Jeremiah, who was uh, part of the remnant who were uh, 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 trying to bring the children of Judah and the children of Israel back to God. In fact, um, when uh, Jeremiah writes all these things, the king really takes his pen knife and cuts these things and put them in fire. And Jeremiah has to write the scroll again. When he confronts these people in Jeremiah chapter 44, do you know what they want to do? They want to carry him by force to Migdol down to Egypt so that uh, by force he may be able to behold their abominations. Don't you see this is what happens in our churches that uh, when you rise against sin, and you try to bring back people to the uh, uh, revealed truth of God, the people will want to silence you, and not only to silence you, but they will want you to sit there silent and behold more of their abominations that is happening within the church. And so these are people who love to wander away. And uh, you know why this thing became uh, so heinous is because if you do all you want to do and all these abominations out of the sanctuary, please, it's okay with that. Go continue doing that. But when you bring these things in the sanctuary, we are told there is no remedy because the sanctuary is the central pillar of our redemption. It is uh, the, the, the way of the Lord. And so uh, you can tremble the other places that you like. I'm not saying that we should do that. But when you enter into the sanctuary to provoke God in his own dwelling place, you better be sure that uh, there's no more remedy for sin. According to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26, if we sin willfully after knowing the truth, there remains no sacrifice for our sin, but uh, a fearful uh, judgment awaits us if we do these things. And so the sanctuary is a revelation of every step of human probation. And uh, when uh, we pollute it, there, there's no other remedy for sin. And so uh, we can read that in the book of uh, Second Chronicles, 
the book of Second Chronicles, uh, uh, why these sins in the sanctuary were of the most heinous uh, uh, character. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 14 to 16, moreover, all the chief of the priest and the people transgressed um, uh, very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which uh, he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. And so uh, when uh, these things happen in the sanctuary, when all these abominations are, um, are carried uh, into the sanctuary, then it means that uh, there is no remedy that is uh, found that uh, can be made for our sins because uh, the sanctuary is the place for meeting the Lord. He says that uh, in Exodus chapter 25, there I'll meet with thee. And if so, the Lord cannot meet with us in the sanctuary. Where else can he meet us? There is no other place. And so when uh, after reading the book of Ezekiel chapter 8, you go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 3, and uh, we are told, and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 4 and verses 18, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And remember, uh, he had told them that uh, I'll do to this house what uh, uh, I did to Shiloh. I'll, I'll, I'll do to this house what... Uh, I did to Shiloh. And what happened at Shiloh? The glory of the Lord departed. And uh, after the glory of the Lord departed, the children of Israel were able to be taken to captivity. Now, this is the same scenario that we are seeing. As uh, we continue doing all this abomination, worshiping strange gods, you saw that in Patriarchs and uh, Prophets that... Um, when Satan knew that Canaan was the land of habitation, he introduced strange gods amongst them to prevent them from going or staying into the land of Canaan. And they were taken by their enemies. And we are told that he is repeating the same, introducing strange gods as we are nearing there, a uh, uh, spiritual Canaan. And all these abominations of doing the things that are not in the word of God, this will take the glory of God from amongst us and what shall remain? Nothing. But uh, as this happened, the children of Israel continued in their ceremonies thinking that they were sacrificing unto God when they were sacrificing unto their own perversions. And so we can be here on this earth right now as we speak right now and continue in the ceremonies of the Sabbath, continue bringing in these dandies, continue bringing in these Trinitarian gods, continue bringing in this uh, uh, ecumenism, continue mismanaging, mismanaging the funds, the tithes and offering, continue participating in wars, continue participating in defiling our temples by this um, uh, 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 injecting ourselves of the things which the Lord has prohibited in the book of uh, Leviticus, and we think that we are doing God's service when the glory of the Lord has departed. My plea this evening is that uh, this night is that uh, we may bring ourselves to the sanctuary again and measure what we are doing with the sanctuary if it's acceptable in that sanctuary. Um, the Lord is still seeking to save us and uh, he is willing to give us his spirit so that uh, we may be part of those who shall be translated. But uh, if we can use this time allotted of probation to make our act right 
to remedy every defect in our characters to allow him work in us, then uh, probation will close on us as it closed to the children of Israel. And whom shall we blame but ourselves for the things that we have done in our bodies? And so may the Lord be with us. May we try to analyze these things that uh, in these abominations, there is the sealing and there is the departing of the glory of God. And so when the glory of the Lord departs, will we be found in the book of life or will we be found wandering in the balances of the sanctuary? Otherwise, may the Lord bless us. And uh, may we think about our worship. Are we worshiping according to the fallen churches? Or are we worshiping according to the truth which has been revealed in the word of God? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, once again, glory and honor be unto thy name. We thank you because the history of the children of Israel is written for us, who has come to the ends of the world, that we may consider the things that we do, if uh, they are acceptable before thee, or they are abominations only to confuse us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we may not follow the traditions of men and the doctrines of men, but uh, we may cite the scriptures, and uh, in it we may find the truth, and by the spirit of thy son, be able to overcome every evil cultivated tendencies and uh, every evil hereditary, um, hereditary. Thank you for accepting us in thy son, and thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.